by saying that uh, uh, Colette's actually right. We're in the middle of a field work course, a field methods course uh, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And it's uh, the first time that there's been such a course, to the best of my knowledge, because we don't have a tradition of field work in Israeli linguistics, except for, I would say, the description of some Semitic languages that are spoken in Israel, so Arabic, now Aramaic. And I think that's really about it. But what we do have in Israel is a tradition of descriptive linguistics. And for me today, it was um, really um, striking to see that a topic which seems to be of such limited interest, right? So uh, ancient Egyptian Coptic linguistics on one hand and linguistic typology on the other, nonetheless brought out, um, I think the most people that were sitting here today was 50 people at my count. Um, and this is interesting because it shows that there's an interest in uh, descriptive linguistics and general linguistics without necessarily having to have a particular allegiance to a particular formalism or, or a set of formalisms and so on. So this was um, nice. So this is... Uh, yeah. I wanted to say just a few words about the relationship between um, descriptive linguistics and typology. So in one, I think, not, not trivial sense, and this is a sense that was highlighted by a few of the speakers today, uh, the descriptions of individual languages provide the material for typology. It's impossible to do typology without descriptions, and it's not possible to do typology without good descriptions that you can trust, as uh, Colette highlighted, and so on. So that's one sense. And another sense in which typology and descriptive linguistics are related I think is something that anyone who's been to a typology conference can relate to, which is that typology provides a framework for descriptive linguists to engage with general linguistics, um, again, without having to do things in a particular formalism. So if one goes to a conference of a, a association of linguistic typology, I would say that very few of the people who are um, give, presenting there are giving really these kind of Greenbergian cross-linguistic comparisons based on, um, uh, let's say, balanced samples and really looking for cross-linguistic universals. Actually, the majority of talks at such conferences tend to be, look at this cool thing that I found in my language while I was doing field work. And in this sense, um, Egyptian and, and Chakaltek are really no different from each other. And it's in order to get some sort of um, reaction to see if maybe someone else has something interesting like this in their language to see what kind of contexts uh, you find for such constructions and so on. Um, and so in this sense, I think the typology is um, um, constituted and will probably continue to constitute um, a major point of reference for Egyptian descriptive linguistics as it does for, I would say, really descriptive linguistics of nearly all language families, right? So I prepared some slides which are just not working. Unfortunately, so this might be in the interest of uh, shortening um, uh, words. Could you? No, no, it's it's my stupid computer. What? You see, it has the spinning wheel of death. Oh. Oh. Okay. No. Okay, it's okay. It's it's enough for me. Just uh, don't worry. Um, all right. So, I mean, we could also take from the um, outset the question of why is this even interesting? I mean, why should we have a discussion of Quo Vadis, uh, Egyptian linguistics in the twenty first century? I mean, do we need these things? Do we have a discussion of Quo Vadis, uh, Caribbean linguistics in the twenty first century? I mean, what's what's at stake here? What are we worried about? Um, um, I mean, it's important to say that the description of each and every language is important for uh, different kinds of reasons. So the, really one of the first reasons, and this is, I think, what Colette highlighted today, is the needs of speakers and communities. And so this is a real reason why description and documentation of every language is important. And I think this really relates to actually the non the things that linguists are generally not necessarily interested in. But linguists and linguistics also have needs. And one of these needs is to know about uh, the possible diversity of human language. Um, um, all right, so I mentioned uh, this stuff. I just wanted very briefly to return to things. And in fact, Stefan said it better than, 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 than I could. Um, and I wanted to address this feeling um, that came across today in some of the talks, which is um, this kind of feeling of relief that 
ah, okay, Egyptian Coptic is just another language, you know, say it's just right branching and with relatively rigid word order and so on. Um, and Martin's claim that um, Coptic has no words, but this is actually a, not a very extravagant claim because words, word is a useless notion uh, for linguistics. And slightly at a different angle, we had Walter's claim that the relationship between nominalization, finiteness, and information structure in Polotsky's analysis of Egyptian verbs is cross-linguistically expected and usual and really nothing to get excited about um, in some respects. Um, so this is really one angle on uh, typology and its relationship with uh, descriptive linguistics, right? Is this feeling, okay, it's just a normal language. But again, how do we know these things in advance? And here we turn to um, what Balthasar Bickel characterized as the turn towards um, typology as diversity linguistics, so the attempt to answer what's where, why, right? And this really highlights another aspect, an important aspect of the relationship between descriptive linguistics and typology. So this is a well-known diagram taken from um, Matthew Dreyer's discussion of absolute versus statistical universals, right? And so what Dreyer says is that we could think that typology is about finding out what possible languages are, and then what we're interested in is defining this space, right? And so here we have this box, right? And a naive assumption might be that linguistic structures are distributed either randomly or evenly. Okay. No, the problem is if I, if I make it bigger, then it gives me the spinning wheel of death on my very nice Macintosh. All right. So, all right. But what actually what we find uh, after many decades of uh, Greenbergian typology is that the distribution of linguistic features in the world's languages rather looks like this. So we have some um, skewed distributions. And then what we have is not some black box that tells us what's possible and what's impossible, but rather we have outliers. Right? So things which are definitely possible and are, are, are in fact attested. Right? Um, so of course this is an interesting and important thing for linguists to be occupied with because sometimes extremely rare features, very exotic features, become the uh, basis for modern linguistic theory and perhaps the best example of this is agreement, right? in which English style grammatical agreement, which is vanishingly rare in the world's languages, was turned into the basis for uh, basically all um, formal theories of agreement, right? And so that's something that we really have to be careful about. But the other thing that people have pointed out, and there's really nothing new, is that almost all proposed universals of language have turned out not to be absolute, but rather, than, uh, but rather to be statistical or basically um, tendencies you know, of various, varying strengths. So up until 2008, it was possible to say all languages have some sort of coronal segment in their phoneme inventory, but then Juliet Blevins came and showed that in this language, Northwestern Makeo, an Austronesian language of Papua New Guinea, there's no uh, coronal um, um, segment. And so this is interesting because this tells us something about what's really a learnable and transmissible language. Right? So it also forces us to, to or at least pushes us in the direction of different types of explanations. Because if we could say that there's something inherently biological about the knowledge of language that requires us to have coronal segments, so Northwestern Makeo tells us that this isn't true. And this pushes us rather in the direction of, let's say, a functional usage-based historical explanation, on the other hand. Um, so what I'm basically trying to say here is, that, and this is really shouldn't be shocking to anyone here, is that every language counts, at least potentially, specifically for this question of what the limits to linguistic diversity are. So very recently, and this some contributions of spoken languages of Latin America, and recently a sound that no one knows was possible, a uvular flap was found in the Caribbean language, Cuicuro. Um, this was published, I forget by whom, by um, Demolin Fausto and Franchetto, and I think it just came out. And another language, a Takanoan language called Waikana, they found in a, a pre-aspirated fricative. So, okay, maybe this is not the kind of thing that um, floats everyone's boat to know about these hitherto uh, unknown sounds, but nonetheless, this does tell us something about the limits to linguistic diversity and how these limits are pushed further and further by each language that's being described. And so this is really the connection, I would say, between uh, Colette's talk about fieldwork and uh, Egyptian Coptic descriptive linguistics. So I'd just like to point out some <coughs> rare features that uh, Egyptian Coptic 
contribute to linguistic typology. <coughs> Stefan mentioned some of them. One of them was pointed out, I think, for the first time by Martin in his uh, sketch of Egyptian and Coptic, which is that Coptic has uh, what seems to be very rare tense aspect mood specific focus morphology on the verb. And this particular constellation seems to be a relatively rare thing. Uh, Coptic um, has a zero marked second person singular feminine. Uh, marker, it's paradigmatic, it's in, um, in, in nearly every verb form. This is actually seems to be um, not only rare, but um, unknown, right? In other languages of the world, as far as I can tell. Um, Coptic has an extremely elaborate kind of uh, nominal incorporation, which incorporates things that are much bigger than bare roots, in uh, distinction to uh, Marian Mithun's um, and Mark Baker's understanding of noun incorporation. Um, Stefan discussed um, Coptic's extremely high prefixing preference, and I mean, again, we could say, following Martin's talk, that there are no prefixes because there are no words, but I don't think it really matters in this particular case, because what we do find, nonetheless, is that Coptic has an extremely high percentage of uh, inflectional categories expressed before the verb, uh, using these verb. Um, Martin, these are what you call the micromorphemes? Many morphemes, I'm sorry. All right. Um, and just to show you the way that um, the Coptic uh, Egyptian uh, descriptive linguistics can help us advance a little bit uh, how typology understands things. So I tried to publish a paper um, about how uh, Matthew Dreyer said there's no such thing as adverbial subordinator, subordinator prefixes. So there's no language that he found in his sample in which adverbial subordination is marked by prefixes on the verb. But I said, hey, that's exactly what Coptic does. So of course this article was rejected because people didn't find this to be of general interest, but what happened is that um, other people said, hey, I have that in my language too. Um, and so we together wrote an article in which we found that in a number of languages which are genetically unrelated from different areas of the world, this feature is nonetheless present. And I mean, maybe this article would be uh, accepted, who knows. Um, so you just see, this is from Jafu, which is a Tibeto-Burman language, Cree, a native language of uh, North American, Coptic, um, a dead language with no speakers left. Um, but interestingly, what um, we, I leave this alone, what this pushed us to look at is to really think hard about what the sources of cross-linguistic rarity are. Because you could say, perhaps, you know, something isn't grammaticalized in languages because it's not functionally useful or because, you know, speakers have no need for this, but in fact, we don't know this in advance. And what we think about this particular case, for example, is that uh, the diachrony, uh, biases what we actually find in languages because in principle there's absolutely no reason why languages shouldn't have adverbial um, subordinator prefixes. It's not logically worse than suffixes for the, for the marking of the same thing. But what does seem to be the case? That the sources for these kind of constructions tend to be either reanalyzed case markers or um, old auxiliary verbs. So what we know about this is that case suffixes are much more common than case prefixes, right? So the input structures for the diachronic change are just rarer. And as for verbs, if you have to have, um, if the kind of source construction that would facilitate this would be VSO word order, in which some sort of subordinating morpheme is always adjacent to the verb, this is what would facilitate the development of this. Well, then we know that VSO is much rarer than other word orders. And so this is the kind of thing that would inhibit the development of such constructions. And it turns out that if you think about this and you look at um, rare structures, you can actually make a typology of the kind of um, diachronic situations that obstruct or facilitate uh, the development of structures that synchronically are rare or frequent in terms of their distribution. So in some cases, it might be a simple question of the rarity of a pathway. Right? So you could say dissimilation is rarer than assimilation, which occurs all the time, nonstop, in spoken language. Um, stages. This is something that Alice Harris pointed out in her discussion of the morphosyntax of uh, Caucasian languages, is that if a change would have to take, would require something like nine stages that happen in a particular order, this, by the nature of things, is going to be more rare than something that happens in one simple step. Another factor. Um, which I noted earlier is the rarity or frequency of source constructions. So something that requires, let's say, verb initial order is going to be rarer than something that, that 
can happen with subject initial orders and so on. Um, and um, well, all right. And there's another issue which is very difficult to talk about still, but it might be that there are things we're just inherently unstable. So it might be that languages innovate all the time, let's say, I don't know, pre-nasalized stops, but for whatever perceptual or production reasons, um, these just aren't transmitted, right? But again, I think we really don't know enough about any of this yet to say something very definite. So, again, Egyptian is a language like any other language, um, as we talked about this morning, but one thing that is true and, uh, and a bit special about Egyptian, it's one of the very few languages that allow us to observe long-term and often cyclical changes over millennia. I think we basically have Chinese, we have Greek, we have Aramaic, and very few other languages that are attested for this kind of time depth where you really have corpora uh, that you can look at, and therefore this language is, a, is really an excellent laboratory for evaluating diachronic explanations based not on inference or theory or um, uh, reconstruction, but really on documented uh, uh, texts. Okay. So, quo vadis, and again, I think that the whole question is, 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 is not only pretentious, but it's misplaced. Um, is that obviously we're going in the direction of more engagement with general linguistics, whatever that means. Um, I would like to say um, what I think it means a little bit. Um, it of course requires students who are interested uh, in this connection between Egyptian and uh, linguistics, which is not a trivial thing in most universities. It requires um, academic environments like what we see today at the Israel Academy of Science, which is willing to take this kind of topic seriously, right, and to support it uh, rather generously. I have to say it also um, is strongly facilitated by, um, by linguists like um, Martin and Walter and Iran and Ruth and others who are willing to really foster, um, uh, I would say, Egyptian linguistics in this uh, transitional period of becoming more communicative and clearer and um, and so on. And of course, it's also uh, it's helped out by publishers who are willing to take a leap of faith and, and devote entire book series and so on to this really admittedly esoteric um, uh, field. One of the interesting things that I wasn't expecting and which came uh, to be clearer to me in recent years, since Stefan and I began editing these volumes on uh, Egyptian, is um, that what we really need more than anything, really much more than any kind of um, engagement with general linguistics, is that we need more um, descriptive studies of Egyptian. And there's a very interesting thing to find out because we have you know, multiple grammars of, of various stages of Egyptian, and Egyptian data are cited in a number of um, typological studies. But it turns out that we actually know extremely little about what Egyptian was actually like. Just to give you an example, there's been a spate of articles written recently from a variety of linguistic perspectives about possessive constructions in Egyptian, both in Middle Egyptian and over the history of Egyptian. Martin contributed a, an important article to this discussion, but it turns out that there's actually no descriptive study of this question in Middle Egyptian, which is the stage of the language that every student studies first, or most students outside of Jerusalem. Um, and it turns out we just don't know anything about this. Not only this, we were unable to recruit someone to do this descriptive study um, for, the pub, for the purposes of uh, putting together this um, volume on possession. So how do we get more descriptive studies of Egyptian Coptic? And um, we're not an enormous field, and we all have lots of commitments. We have to create students um, who are both linguists and Egyptologists, which means we need both a philology and fieldwork. I don't really um, know how one does this. I think it can happen mainly in places like Jerusalem, Berlin, Leipzig, that really have both linguists and uh, Egyptologists who can have the, um, the good sense and the goodwill to get together and try to do things jointly and encourage this. But I mean, really, I think that if we ask this question of quo vadis, it's, it's strongly contingent on having new students who are going to do PhDs doing descriptive studies of Egyptian and who can become engaged with uh, general linguistics. So this is what I wanted to say. I hope I didn't talk too long. And uh, the floor is really over to you guys. So I think that's it.